Today, we are joined by Diana Denke, the CEO and co-founder of Fair Carbon. As you'll hear in this episode, Fair Carbon exists to support the stewards of marine and coastal ecosystems with a broader mission to facilitate the development and growth of blue carbon markets. I hope you'll enjoy the conversation. What has not been working is the governance and the accountability aspect. And that is fundamentally a people's problem and not a mechanism problem. So uh, in my mind, yes, it's great to think about creating new markets like biodiversity or nature credits because um, you know the, the values and the services and the goods that nature provides are obviously going beyond carbon as we have seen with the many benefits. So yes, let's not think in a tunnel vision and just talk about carbon all the time. Welcome to Nature Is, where we brainstorm, share innovative ideas, and have conversations to stir our spirits and elevate our actions for a better world. Diana Denke, CEO and co-founder of Fair Carbon. Welcome to Nature Is. Thank you, Laura. Happy to be here. So good to have you. We're speaking today from our respective mountain homes, me in the uh, Paradise Valley in the Absorca Mountains of Montana, and you from Vebier in the Swiss Alps. So um, some nice alpine connections here. Though we will be uh, talking about the underwater world today, despite our, our alpine locations and the work that Fair Carbon is leading on um, the world's marine and coastal ecosystems. So, Diana, the origins of, of Fair Carbon have a really beautiful story. Shall we begin by having you share that with our guests? Sure. Um, thanks for asking, Laura. So the origins of Fair Carbon bring us to um, John Vermilia, who is a long-term ocean advocate. And he started um, a foundation with his wife, Antoinette Vermilia, called Gallifrey Foundation. And Gallifrey has been founding um, ocean conservation initi initiatives worldwide for a long time. And at one point, John realized that he, he wanted to offset the residual emissions of his travel business. And he being really passionate about the oceans, he was looking for blue carbon because that was a, a natural um, kind of interest for him. But he found that um, there was only a handful of blue carbon projects worldwide. And that led him on a quest to try and find why this is the case. And so he did a study in which he discovered that this market is underdeveloped, it's fragmented, and it's inaccessible to many of the local communities that are actually um, um, could be working to restore and protect the, the coastal ecosystems. So he basically set out on a quest to, to change this. And his um, aspiration and mission was to find a way to lower the barriers um, so that um, communities can access these markets and to bridge the gap between investors and corporates and local communities that um, are, are working to restore and protect coastal and marine ecosystems. So initially, Fair Carbon was a, a project within Gallifrey Foundation, and it drew in a group of really passionate individuals who wanted to support the stewards of um, coastal ecosystems. Uh, to be able to access the blue carbon markets and provide them with information and capacity building. And so I think people hear a lot about um, above ground biomass like trees and their carbon sequestration potential um, equally with soils and regenerative agriculture um, through deep rooted, um, deep, deep roots and grasses and the, the carbon sequestration potential there. But I wonder if you can help us understand the aquatic equivalent um, and the carbon sequestration potential of ocean ecosystems, which you reference, um, and the role that mangroves and tidal marshes and seagrass meadows play in not only regulating the health of the planet, but equally regulating human health. 
Sure. So, I mean, let's look at them one by one because they are all a little bit different. Um, mangroves, for me personally, and I think for many of us working in this field, are just superheroes. They can store up to three to ten times more carbon per hectare than a tropical rainforest. And salt marshes are very similar in a sense that, um, you know, these are coastal wetlands that fill and drain with the tides. So you see the same fluctuation of water and the soil there is consists of deep mud and peat. And peat is a thick um, uh, plant matter that just keeps accumulating over time. And similar to mangroves, these, these are um, environments in which the decomposition rate of organic matter is slowed down. This leads to carbon, organic carbon being accumulated over time rather than it being released into the atmosphere. It's not the same as seaweed. Many people are kind of confusing them. They live in shallow water and they form these giant meadows. So what's interesting for seagrass is they only make up of 0.1% of the ocean floor, but they are responsible for 11% of organic carbon that is getting stored in the oceans. This is so helpful and, and the visuals are really powerful. I, I think it gives people a, a sense of um, so much of the ecosystem service that the oceans provide, which we, which we may not even um, consider. So that's a great segue to talking about the concept of blue carbon, what that is, but then also the, um, the incredible potential that, the, you know, that these ecosystems have for blue carbon projects like the ones that, that Fair Carbon is working on. And I think that might help people to understand through the work that you're doing just how these projects are being scaled. Yeah, so blue carbon essentially just means carbon that is stored in coastal and marine ecosystems. These uh, coastal blue carbon ecosystems are actually really important for the economy, for the fight against climate change, for uh, biodiversity for for economic empowerment of communities and together they are actually valued at, valued at 190 billion US dollars a year and um, if you just alone take into account their ability to reduce the risk of flooding they can um, um, reduce damages caused by flooding by 65 billion dollars uh, a year globally so immensely valuable ecosystems, and they are also hugely, hugely threatened. Sometimes we see the the illustration of the tidal waves coming in and out with mangroves. And so you see these huge waves coming into a coast, they hit the mangroves, and then uh, the other side of the water is not only clear, but it's tranquil. So I think this is, you know, one of the points you're making, which is, is the coastal um, preservation uh, component with respect to stormwater surges and the like, but so many other co-benefits. And, and you rightly point out the, the biodiversity aspects. These are homes for so many creatures. Yeah. And look, it's, there's always going to be a distinction. Do we, do we invest in gray infrastructure? You know, do we try to build dams? Do we try to protect coastal cities against sea level rise or increasing frequency of floods or you know, do, do you invest in nature? And, and I think, you know, the answer should be at least both, but definitely do not disregard the ability of nature to, to provide those benefits. Absolutely. And um, on that note, Diana, are there a couple of projects that Fair Carbon is working on to that end that, that you feel would be important to, to highlight? We have asked ourselves the question of why is the blue carbon market so fragmented? Why is it still so small scale? Um, you know, when John started this um, with this idea, there was less. There was about a handful of projects worldwide. That was um, four years ago. Today, there is still less than fifty projects that are registered on uh, on on globally accredited carbon registries. And if it's just not in line with the potential and the and uh, the vastness of these these ecosystems uh, around the world. So why is that? Why don't we see many more projects coming to to fruition or coming to the market? And we believe that uh, there are mainly three barriers that really impede the growth of this specific sector. One is the technical barriers, the technological complexity of 
uh, protecting and restoring mangroves, it's a little bit more complicated than working with forests and terrestrial carbon. The second one is around policy and regulatory environment. I mean, that alone is is quite a complex landscape, and it's it can be pretty hard for um, investors or projects to try and navigate and map out which countries are ready for for uh, investment. And the third one is access to finance. I mean, we know that a lot of these projects are early stage in their infancy, and because there has been so few projects uh, out there, the the track record of the of the sector is also still quite um, small. And so what we do at Fair Carbon is we actually look at all these barriers and try to offer solutions to overcome them. And our entire mission is on how we can facilitate a growth of a high integrity blue carbon market, but one that works for the many, not just the few. And we always come back to the question of you know, how can we ensure that the people that are working on the ground, that are protecting and restoring these ecosystems, the land stewards, how can they benefit uh, from the work that they do? And whether through the carbon markets or the nature markets, um, that's the ultimate question that we come back to. Well, I think that's a really helpful way of, of thinking about um you know, blue carbon in the broader context of the nature marketplace, which is kind of growing in, um, in popularity and, um, and in significance. And just given the controversy around the voluntary carbon markets in, in recent years, I, you know, I think companies like yours, like Fair Carbon, have some really thoughtful insights on navigating those dynamics. So maybe you can just speak a little bit to that, because I think it's really worth highlighting. Yeah, look, I, I fully hear the shout outs that, you know, we need high integrity, we need credibility, we need trust. Just because the the voluntary carbon markets um, have had examples where those standards and principles were not met, it doesn't mean that they are wrong or that we should be stopping investing in them. Because what has not been working is the governance and the accountability aspect. And that is fundamentally a people's problem and not a mechanism problem. So uh, in my mind, yes, it's great to think about creating new markets like biodiversity or nature credits, because um, you know the, the values and the services and the goods that nature provides are obviously going beyond carbon, as we have seen with the many benefits. So yes, let's not think in a tunnel vision and just talk about carbon all the time. But how can we ensure that the same mistakes are not repeated elsewhere? I mean, it's it's a fundamentally on how do we create design systems that are of high integrity? And how can we govern them in a way that it, those principles can be enforced? And today, that's what's missing. Yes, regulation will happen. And in the long run, it will inform and better align investment decisions. But in the meantime, there needs to be some action because if we wait for regulation, it's it's going to be too late. I wonder if you have any advice for people that are listening that want to become more engaged in marine and coastal conservation through Fair Carbon. Um, any suggestions you have if they want to get engaged? And what does Fair Carbon need to continue to scale its positive impact in the world? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, we um, we offer a couple of things to to lower the technical barriers. One of them is blue car is the Blue Carbon Academy. It's an online course that aims to democratize access to blue carbon knowledge worldwide and it's a step-by-step jargon-free actionable guidance on how uh, a project can get from just exploring the idea of whether starting a blue carbon project may be even a good thing or feasible to then guiding all the way through the journey to accreditation and then beyond to monitoring and verification. We want to make it easy for projects, buyers, governments, policymakers, academics, anyone that wants to learn about blue carbon to access that knowledge. And so um, this academy is available online through our website. We are 
publishing country profiles that, where people can read about what is the policy and regulatory landscape in a given country and download it uh, for free from our website. And we hope that this can guide investors and developers alike in understanding uh, which markets are more ready uh, for blue carbon. We also offer a webinar series um, uh, bi-monthly where we invite um, experts and practitioners in the field to dissect topics that are important. Oh, that's great. And so many um, wonderful open source uh, resources. Uh, that's, uh, that's a really wonderful contribution to the community. We'll be sure to include that in the, in the notes and I'll have to do the, the Blue Carbon Academy myself. <laughs> so Diana, always, always our last question here, one that's, that's grounded in nature. Can you share any of your first memories of the natural world and um, how those led you to the, the passions that you have for preservation and restoration? Yeah, I mean, I always joke about it, but, you know, my parents, my mom and dad, they couldn't be more different personalities. I, I love them both dearly. And uh, but one thing that unites them is this immense love for nature. And so every memory I have from really early childhood has been in and around nature. You know, we spend pretty much all weekends, you know, hiking in a forest or by the sea and or, or going skiing in the Alps, or um, sailing on the lake. So I think that my most beautiful and fun childhood memories that involve my family has been taking place in nature. And so I think it's not a, it's not a coincidence that I ended up caring so much for wanting to um, safeguard our planet. Well, um, thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, and uh, you know, Fair Carbon is, is contributing so much to our marine and coastal uh, environments and we're deeply grateful. So keep up the great work and um, we look forward to staying in touch. Thank you.